Who did you want to be before you became who you are today and why? Oh, gosh. Um, no pressure. <laughs> yeah, no pressure. Who did I want to, to be? Well, you know what? I I always really looked up to my family. Uh, my, my father and my mother, both self-employed. Um, my father was a builder and, um, you know, he would work all the hours under the sun. And I always sort of looked up to to that sort of, I guess, work ethic. But also I love that he loved what he did. He really enjoyed his work. And and then similar with my mum, she was actually an air hostess. That oh, was, nice. um, Very yeah, nice. which, you know, going back, uh, you know, in, in the sort of the, the 80s was was quite a luxurious, um, you know, job to have. And and she absolutely loved it. Uh, but when my parents decided to have uh, children, she, she stopped. I think I just started high school. So my mum would have been, you know, mid 40s. Uh, she went back to university and studied to become a counsellor. Oh, wow. And I just, I know. And at the time I thought like, okay, good on you. But I didn't really comprehend only now as an adult thinking, my God, the sort of education she would have gone through at her age and, that, you know, how massively things changed. You know, she had to teach herself how to use, you know, word processor on a, on a computer. And she went back to uni and studied and got a degree. And, I'm, and that sort of, that, I guess, that attitude uh, was something I really looked up to and, and admired. Would you say you had have experienced or are experiencing that feeling with your work of being really happy and fulfilled and really enjoying it? Yeah, yeah. I feel so lucky, honestly. I, I really do. Um, I remember uh, reading um, a book. It was uh, by Ben Bergeon. He's a, a CrossFit trainer. And it sounds like a really tenuous link, but basically he um, talks a lot about living your life and uh, being the best athlete you can be, you need to be the best person you can be. And his um, theory is blurring the line between work and play. And if you can get that in your life, that you don't realize you're going to work because it's a hobby or it's a passion or it's something you, you love, then that's that's the dream. And my gosh, you know, when I'm commentating, I'm sometimes at you know the best game of the year, a World Cup final. I've got the best seat in the house talking about a game I love to someone who's also loves the game mm -hmm. and I'm getting paid to be here. It's like, <laughs> wow, how is this, you know, work? It's not. It, it. So in that sense, I feel, yes, incredibly lucky. And then with my building career as well, to be able to have you know, gone through what, what at times was very, very challenging. I set it up in 2007 when we were going through a bit of a recession. So it wasn't the best time to set up a yeah. business. But came through that and it's still surviving today through lockdowns and COVIDs and everything. And uh, so to have that, which is a complete difference then if I'm what I'm doing on a Saturday or Sunday with sport to then on a Monday running a, you know, a building job or an extension or something completely different. But I love the difference and I love how both of them challenge me. And I, I love how they're both hard work at times, but they're so rewarding. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I feel I feel, you know as close as what I hoped I would I would get to yeah I actually did want to touch on your building work because I had listened to I think it was one of one of the podcasts that you commentate on and they mentioned they gave your bio and it was like this very long yeah. <laughs> long yes. decorated <laughs> list and then it was like oh and she also yeah. runs a construction business and I was yeah. like I need <laughs> I need to understand <laughs> um yeah. and whilst I definitely want to get to rugby and the sport um I, yeah, tell me about because I, I know you mentioned your dad works in construction, so I can see like the obvious. Now it kind of makes sense and the obvious links yeah. are there. But maybe just kind of explain why um, yeah. and and how that came to it coexist with your work in sport. Yeah, so uh, it was very much family driven. Mm -hmm. um, my father was a builder. My grandfather was a builder. Oh wow! So I'd always yeah, I'd always sort of grown up around it. As I mentioned, my father, bless him, he'd work all the hours under the sun, especially when we were young and he was sort of setting up. Uh, so on Saturdays, school holidays, I'd go to work with him and I didn't, you know, do anything really constructive for the first couple of years. But I think it was just ingraining that work ethic of you've got to get up on a Saturday morning. We've got to get out. We go to site. And I literally I just spent all the time cleaning up because that was the only sort of safest <laughs> thing I could do was tidy and cleaning. But, you know, I loved it. I love that sense of, um, I guess, a bit of responsibility at a young age, you know, is, is quite good. And I love the practical element of it. And I didn't really ever think about it as a career. It was just something I did on the holidays, weekends, earned a bit of money. And it was only really when I was at uni and I actually did a, a business communications course. 
that uh, I did a modular where they said, you know, write a, a business plan. It can be about anything. And you had to do the whole thing, you know, your, your financial planning, your marketing, the, the whole shebang. And I did it on a um, an all-female building company. Oh, wow. So I thought there's no one out there doing it. Um, and everyone was always so shocked when I said, you know, <laughs> being like in my lectures and people, you know, would be saying, oh, we've got like two or three hours off now, what are you doing? And I'd be like, oh, I'm going down Mrs. Jones's to plaster a ceiling. And they'd be like, what? You're doing what? You know, whereas they just go to a coffee shop and do a couple of hours. So I sort of realized then that the skills I'd learned over the years uh, could be quite valuable and I could actually use it as a career. So I wrote this business plan and um, my lecturer at the time sort of pulled me aside and he said, you know, if you seriously, if you can do this, you should really think about it. And at the time, uh, the Welsh government was offering grants to post grads in Wales if you wanted to set up your own business. And it was quite substantial. I think it was um, it was it was about seven or eight thousand wow. pounds released over, a, you know, I think it was a two year term. Mm -hmm. uh, so I applied for that and, and I won it. Nice. Uh, Congrats. Yeah. So in 2007, uh, Female Building and Interiors was born. And so tell me how rugby coincides with this yes. and how how do they coexist well it's a it's a bit of an interesting one actually because i played rugby during an amateur era so at times unfortunately they couldn't both exist so i first learned uh, to play uh, rugby actually at university and um, by the time i graduated from uh, university i got involved with like a regional team so i was kind of on that pathway to, to working up and then it was around the same time uh, I launched my business and I was sort of in like Wales A, which is like a development squad. So okay. they're sort of nurturing you to make that next step, which was incredible. And I loved it. But I found that I was trying to set up my business and, you know, female building interiors at the start was just me. You yeah. know, <laughs> I was admin. I was marketing. I was seeing the jobs. I was doing the jobs. It, it literally was all on my shoulders. And yet then around that, I was trying to train three or four times a week yeah. in, a, in a sport that's very physically demanding, as well as trying to review performances, going to games on weekends. And I just found I was struggling quite a bit. So I made one of the hardest decisions, actually, up until that point in my career, at least, was that I knew, you know, these were two massive things. And if I was to make a go of either of them, I needed to prioritise one. So I stepped away from rugby right. and I focused purely on the on the business. And it grew then over the next couple of years. And I managed to find a couple of more women in Cardiff that were working in the industry that we would team up together. Yeah. And slowly but surely it sort of grew. And then it was only about probably about five or six years later that because um, I'd always kept in, in contact with my friends who had played rugby when we were like in Wales A and stuff. And I'd see on their like social medias, you know, that in the Six Nations, they were going to World wow. Cups and yeah. And as amazing as it was, and I was so happy for them, I just had that little thing in the back of my head was just like, oh, I wonder, you know, if you hadn't stopped playing, like, would you have ever done that? Could that be me? And I was so happy with my business. And I had a couple of TV opportunities through the building, which was brilliant and, and really different and challenging. But I just, I couldn't get rid of that, that feeling in the back of my mind. And I was 27, 28 at the time. And I thought, you know, if you don't do it now, you're, you're never going to do it. And you've got a long time to work. You've got the rest of your life to work. You've mm -hmm. only got a short window to play sport to, to that sort of level. Mm -hmm. So I literally, I went right back to my first club, had to start on the bench again. Wow. You know, I probably got the oldest <laughs> person on the bench, like right back at the beginning. But it was brilliant. And I, to be honest, when I started back, I didn't have the ambition of playing for Wales again. I just wanted to play. I just wanted to get back to playing rugby. I really enjoyed the challenge of it. Um, but slowly but surely, I, I sort of worked my way back through the ranks and then ended up then, um, so I was 29, 30, playing rugby for, for Wales and managing to, to run the business. So it kind of, they sort of uh, roller coasted. Parking what was a dream that you were kind of progressing so well in and then actually saying, no, I can still, I think there's still something here. And going back and starting from the beginning, like so many people would not even allow their, their pride would not allow them to yeah. start from the beginning. Um, yeah. And so I, I have so much respect for you for doing that. Or is it really more of a testament to you and your, again, this work ethic that you kind of harken back to your family and just being like, I want to do this. I'm going to do 
my I'm going to work really hard. I'm going to focus. I'm going to do this to the best of my ability. And that just meant that naturally you progress to the the very top of, <laughs> of what you could achieve in in the sport. I think it's important what you said, first of all, about ego and pride, mm -hmm. because that is huge. And a lot of people, I think, get confused sometimes between pride and pride is important. Pride is you want to do the best of your ability at all times. That's important. Ego can catch you out. Mm -hmm. Ego can actually be that quite negative voice in your mind that says, you know, oh, don't ask that question. You should know the answer to that. Oh, no, don't go and talk to that person. They're, you know, they're not important. Their ego is, can be really limiting. Pride is okay. Ego, you've got to keep in check. Yeah, you know, when I was at the point with the building and I was doing a couple of TV shows and, you know, some of them were Channel 4. Um, they were on uh, in the daytime, Channel 4. So I was like, I got quite known in, in that circle and there were some good contracts financially being offered. And when I decided to go back to, to rugby, I had a manager at the time who sort of like, she couldn't really understand. She was like, well, how much do you get paid to play rugby? I was like, ah, get paid? No, 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 no. I said, it's going to cost me to play. But she couldn't understand it. I was like, look, I know it doesn't make financial sense, but this isn't a financial decision. I loved playing rugby. It made me feel kind of alive in a way that nothing else had. I parked the ego that said, God, Phil, you could be a this, that, and whatever, whatever with the TV. No, it's not about that. It's about blurring that line between, you know, work and fun. And rugby was fun. Did you start to feel the strain? Maybe it were similar strains that you were experiencing um, earlier on in your career where you had to make that decision to step away. Were those things starting to crop up even though the business was doing well and kind of self-sustaining in lots of ways? Were you still having that kind of tussle um, between the two? Uh, yeah, I did find it a bit of a juggling act. I think it wasn't so much actually with the work the work was okay you'd have the odd case rarely when you know something went wrong on site and I'm out of the country so then I'm on the phone in between training sessions trying to get the various trades I need to be on site you know but that was very rare but the juggling act more came actually with private life with oh, personal life yeah it was especially for the last and say that it was the hardest the last two years of my career because um at that point we were training to go towards the Commonwealth Games with the Welsh Sevens team. So we were playing in Sevens tournaments all over the world in preparation for this, which just meant I was out of the country a lot and mm. training a lot and trying to see family, friends, make weddings, yeah. birthdays, yeah. anything was just really hard and very difficult when you've been so busy for such a long period of your life. It's almost like people accept in your 20s because I think, oh, God, yeah, you know, you're doing this, you're doing that. But when you're creeping into your 30s as well, I think, although people were understanding, I knew, you know, inevitably some friends would be disappointed if I, if I couldn't make things. And that was probably the hardest part of it all was, was missing things like that. And as much as you think, yeah, but now, you know, I'm in Dubai and I'm playing rugby sevens in yeah. front of 50,000 people and all of that is amazing. But then when you strip it back, the most important people in my life are my family and my close friends. And when you do miss a birthday or a wedding, yeah. you know, miss some pretty big things, that does taint, taint things. And actually, since I've retired, my biggest emphasis on any ad adaptation to my life has been to spend more time with family and friends. And not to try and make up for it, because you can't make up for the past. The past is the past. But... I always try and make sure that they know how important their support was to me during that time and how I never took it for granted. I think I probably did at the at the time. Yeah. Um, but on reflection now, knowing that they stuck stuck with me and put up with me being so, you know, uh, at times flighty, you know, I was here, there and everywhere um, means the world to me. And it's just difficult. And there's no no right answer to it. If you're going to do anything to a ridiculous extreme, which quite often international sport is, or indeed sometimes being self-employed, you know, things are going to take a hit somewhere. But it's important as long as they don't take a hit forever. And then once they have taken that hit, you make sure that you tell the people who are there and with you through that, that you really appreciated that and you didn't take it for granted. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that because I think sometimes that is something that's overlooked. Did you find that even even across ages that 
whilst there, did people have like a similar mindset or similar, like similar character traits that meant that they were just driven or determined to be at that level? Or did you actually find that there was a real mix of personality traits? Yeah, I think there's always a common ground of competitiveness because right. there has to be, no matter how much talent you've got, unless you want to beat the person next to you, you won't rise to that position. Yeah. But work ethic does vary. Okay. And it does sometimes <laughs> coincide with natural ability. Um, and you are always aware of these people and management are always sure. aware of these people. <laughs> and and it's frustrating because um, there's a saying, um, hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. And Ooh, I love that. I've never true. heard the last part of that, actually. Ah, uh, yeah. That's um, good. And it is true. Because to a certain age, talent will get you noticed. It will get you through the door. But to a point, you will get you'll get to a level where you're as talented as the person next to you. But if they've had to work twice as hard as you, then that's not them working hard. That's just them now. That's their attitude. That's how they process every single day. They're working hard. Whereas all of a sudden, you now, you're going to find that massive jump if all of a sudden you've got to try and start working hard. Mm. And I think it's a lifestyle thing. So that is my main message for any youngsters starting out. Yes, you know, play play rugby, enjoy, you know, honing on your natural skill set. And we all have things that we're naturally better at than than others. But never ignore the, the things that you're not so good at and work hard. What was that transition like from playing to actually commentating? What's, what did you have to do to prepare for that, that work? And, mm -hmm. and how did you know you were improving and getting better at it that you wanted to do more of it? So I guess I transitioned quite quickly, actually. I was very lucky. Uh, literally after the Commonwealth Games, I retired and the WIU put a, a press release out saying that I was retiring and it fell on the office, um, the desk of a gentleman called Hugh Tal at the BBC Wales. He was director of sport at the time. And just so happened he lived locally to where I am. Oh, nice. So he got in touch, yeah, via, I think it was like LinkedIn or something like that, and just said, you know, I've seen you retiring. Um, what are you thinking of doing now? Um, have you thought about anything in sports media? I thought, gosh, no, I haven't, but of course, brilliant, new, exciting opportunity. So I met up with him and we had a chat and uh, there's a quite a popular rugby programme here in Wales called Scrum 5. It's just chatting about the, you know, the rugby of the week. And, and he said, well, maybe we'll, we'll start you on that, see how you find it, if you enjoy it, and we'll go from there. Um, and I did, and I was so nervous. Oh, how my gosh. You? But Even you know though you've what, done actually, TV stuff before, was it just the um, change of well, content? <laughs> change of content, yeah. yeah. And there weren't many women. Uh, I think I was the first ex... I think I might have been the first ex-player to appear on the show. But you know what was amazing? And this is actually what made me want to do it more. Before I even got started, I'm sat on the sofa and, um, and the presenters are there and the... Um, uh, uh, a producer i guess comes comes in front of the cameras and he said right we're going live on air in three two one right and when i retired from rugby one thing i thought i'm i'm gonna just i'm gonna miss was the feeling in the tunnel right when you're lined up and it's just it's electric like it's full of nervous energy there are there are players that are bouncing, some are just solely focused. And it's just the most amazing mix of, of nerves and excitement. But you know what? I'm sat on the sofa and I had these nerves. And then he counted down like that. And then these lights came up and I went, oh, my God. Like, there's that feeling, wow. this mixture of nerves and excitement. And I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what questions they're going to ask me, but I've, I've prepared as much as I can. And that was then from, from feeling that I was like... I want to do more of this. Amazing. And, and, and the show went, went well, we talked about rugby, you know, so it's, it's, <laughs> it's what I what I know. Um, and really from that, it was kind of someone saw me on that. And then they asked me to do a game with Five Live, uh, BBC Five Live uh, radio, which was huge, you know. I mean, that's that quite a huge. Kind of yeah. get involved with them, <laughs> yeah. Um, and that was my first uh, Six Nations game. It was um, Scotland, Wales, up in Murrayfield, Five Live with a gentleman called John Barkley, who was the captain of Scotland, but he was currently injured. So he was coming on the microphone. So again, I'm stood there in Murrayfield, best seat of the house, watching the Six Nations, the current captain of Scotland, just <laughs> chatting with me about the game. <laughs> oh my God, what is going on? Like, this is amazing. 
<laughs> and then yeah from that it went to it was then I was lucky because it was the World Cup 2019 so I sort of had a nice run into that and I did some work there and and one thing sort of led to another so I've adapted my style and then just always asking for feedback and not in the most like official can you give me feedback just speaking to other co-commentators or lead commentators yeah. so the people who, who run the game and just say you know how do you prepare what sort of things do you write down and how do you do your notes and how do you make your notes during the game? So just constantly asking. And yeah. even now, you know, when I go away, it's great because um, I work with the sevens rugby. Yeah. So you'll do like a whole tournament over a weekend, which means there will be sometimes five or six lead commentators and four or five co-commentators, so like ex-players. So being around all of them, we're all preparing together. We're all talking about the games together. So you get to see how different people learn, how different people read the game, all of that overarching is awareness you know bringing awareness I could be there and just be having a coffee and having a chill and just chatting whatever but if you've got the awareness of constantly want to just listen and pick up then you will what is the best advice you've ever received and what is the worst advice you've ever received it's not been directly said to me but I've you know being a, a female in in a, a minority sport um sports media and and obviously in a, a minority industry of construction i i go to a lot of um women in construction and, and women in sports and and it's all very rallying and very positive um but i find sometimes the message can go a little too far for me in that some people say you know if you're if you're the minority you need to scream and shout and you need to 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 put your hand up and, and every opportunity, get known and blah, blah, blah. And I guess for some people that might work, but I think the worst advice is generic advice because we're all so individual. And the worst thing you can do is anything that is not you. You know, you are the only expert in you and you know what is right for you. And yes, guidance is important. Support, motivation is important. But being told this is the way you should do it, I think is just the worst advice you can ever have. Because for me, I never scream and shouted at the top of my voice. I've so many times been the only female on a building site uh, pretty much all my life. And I've never made a big issue of it. In fact, I've just cracked on, got my head down and started working. And I've let the work I've done, that speaks the loudest volume for me. But again, that's just individual for me. So yeah, I just think the worst advice can be anyone thinking that they know you because you are the only expert in you. And then the best advice, it's probably, you know, something soft and silly. Like my dad would always say, um, spread a bit of happiness. Oh, that's and nice. we do like, yeah, spread a bit of happiness. Just, and it, you know, you can apply that to any aspect of your life, but it is just about spreading a bit of happiness. Like I always remember this one time we finished a job together. It was just a gardening landscaping job. And we went back on a Sunday morning to this job. And I was like, I thought we were finished. He said, oh, we are finished, but the old boy, he, he can't get down out of the back door very well. It's a bit of a step. So we're just going to put in a little step for him to, to step down. I was like, oh, right, OK. So we did it anyway. And the the, the old the gentleman at the time, he came out and he was like, oh, hello, what are you doing here? Blah, blah. And Dad was like, oh, look, I just put this step in for you. And the guy was so, like, chuffed that we'd come back and put this step in. I didn't even know that it wasn't part of the job. Dad had just got up on a Saturday morning and thought about, oh, you know what, I should have done this, but we could make it even better. Let's just put a step in for him. And he spread a bit of happiness. And that has always stuck with me. So no matter what I do, you know what, if you can spread a bit of happiness, then that's, that's really good. What an amazing ending. <laughs> It's like you're a pro. Uh, <laughs> that's fantastic. I love that. And that's a wrap. If you know someone that would benefit from the knowledge and wisdom shared in this episode, please do share it with them now. To keep up with Wannabe, follow us along on your favourite podcast player or app or follow at Content is Queen HQ on Instagram for the latest updates and episode releases. Until next time, bye.